Hello and welcome back to Information Storage and Retrieval. Today we're going to talk about another general topic, another sort of topic general to information and and um, storing it. Haha, <laughs> right, storing and retrieving, right? So we've talked a lot about process of how to build a search system, but we want to also get into how is some of this stuff actually stored? Uh, and, and what is the, the way that this data exists, um, you know, this data being all of the unstructured information in the world, uh, what are ways that we actually store it on disks and keep it tightly packed? So that's what compression is all about. So, in general, uh, if you've ever used a zip file or had to unzip something, that is compression, right? You are somebody has taken a normal file in its text format and reduced it to save space. Uh, on the left here, I have a file. It's a text file that contains uh, probably maybe not all of Shakespeare's sonnets, but a, a huge chunk of them. And on the disk, that is 96 kilobytes worth of information. That is 96,000 bytes. Bytes are usually eight bits. Um, that's a lot of information, right? Or not a lot, but it's enough to display all of the text of Shakespeare's sonnets to you. When I zip that file, when I, when I compress it, it's now only taking up 40 kilobytes. How is that happening? That's the question today. How, does, how do compression algorithms work and what, what are they actually doing to achieve this? Making all the information a little bit more compact. So the first step of, of why we would want to talk about this is why, why would we care about compression in this, in this information storage and retrieval uh, scenario, the information retrieval system? Uh, and that's because collections, as well as dictionaries themselves, the, the number of terms in a collection, can be friggin' huge. Um, so you need to be able to, you know, when you're scaling up, when your system gets big, you need to start thinking about how you will save space because space is also kind of time, right? The amount of time it takes to process things, to move them, to rearrange all of it, to do your indexing, uh, you, especially if you're doing any of this over a, you know, over a, a internet connection, right? So s the amount of time it takes to transfer all of the bits of the information you're moving around, it's kind of critical. Um, so, so let's talk about how text is actually stored. Text on a computer is stored like everything else that we've kind of already looked at before, it, it's ones and zeros, right? But the ones and zeros are typically arranged into bytes. Uh, a byte is a string of bits, it's usually eight of them, uh, that are ones or zeros, right? And as we talked about a little bit, you know, the, the ones and zeros is just the easiest way for, um, you know, to represent an electrical signal on or off in, in the hardware of a computer. So, um, the term byte can vary a little bit with hardware and with different considerations. So it, it might be longer or, or different in other circumstances. Just typically think of it as an 8-bit byte, right? So one 8-bit byte can represent 256 or 2 to the 8 possible distinct values, which should make some sense. Like there's, there's two possible values in each bit. And then the number of bits you have in the byte is eight, so that's two to the eighth, right? So this is 256 uh, possible different representations, right? It can be all zeros, it can be all ones, and it can be anything in between those, which is plenty for our normal human 26 letter alphabet, even if we go for capital letters, even if we go like capital and lowercase and all kinds of punctuation. That's <clears throat> those 256 bits are that's like plenty. Although I will say we've developed a lot more Unicode characters over time. So ah, I said Unicode, what does that mean? So the encoding of how text is stored is what you can use to sort of understand, okay, if this text is, is a bunch of bytes, right, on the disk, 
the encoding tells me which text characters are going to correspond to each byte, right? To each, uh, sorry, each byte value, right? So for example, <clears throat> in Unicode 8-bit, we have the string ABC. In 8-bit Unicode, A is the value 65. It's the 65th character. There's a bunch of other characters that come before uh, all the letters. It's like carriage returns and system system things for computers to do their job, operating systems to do their job. Um, but in in bits, in eight bits, that is 01000001. A space character is also an important character, even though it's empty space, it's important to displaying the text string ABC, right? And not just abk. So a space is the 32nd character in the Unicode 8-bit encoding, which 32 is 00100000. And so on, we see A space B space C space. You might notice that A, B, and C are all right next to each other, 65, 66, and 67. Kind of makes sense. So let's look at this all together. The string ABC with spaces in it that we know and love, that's a lot of bits to represent that string. If you look at it, that's uh, 8 times 5, 40 bits to represent just three letters and two spaces. If you look at this, there's a lot of zeros. We kind of, you know, if you think back to the incidence matrix, that was kind of the same question. There's a lot of zeros. There's a lot of things that aren't informational here. And the answer is not just get rid of the zeros. That would destroy the patterns of, the, of these bytes that represent the values. But there is a way that we can condense the, the informational content here into something that is tight, more tightly packed. So, text, compressing it. The idea is we're trying to get rid of those redundant zeros as before, right? But we don't want to destroy what's there. We don't want to just, if we change the, the meaning of the, of the bit, uh, not of the bit, of the byte, of the value, that means we lose the character. So we can do this by stepping away from this binary representation and mixing in a little bit of unary. What the heck is unary? Well, let's talk about numerical bases for a minute. So the way you represent a number visually in terms of like the, the digits that you see are dependent on the base that we use. We're almost used to decimal, right? The dec means Latin root for, for 10 decimal places. That means there are 10 possible values for each digit. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Once you get to 9, you reset with a new value ticked up in the next place over, and now you have 10, right? 10 being a 1 in the tens place and a 0 in the ones place. So there's other bases that you might encounter in your programming life. Uh, hexadecimal is hex is 6, dex is, dex is 10, so 16 possible values. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. If you see number values in your things like when you're messing around with CSS for colors, the reason it goes up to F is there's 16 possible places, values per place. Binary is the, the super simplified version. By means two, so there's two possible values per digit, right? So these are all kind of the same idea. It's the same pattern to represent numbers, but you just have different maximum numbers of values per space. So as you count up, right? So when count up, you run out of values in a particular space, in a particular digit, we, you reset that digit and increment the one next to it, right? The, the larger digit. So here you see the binary decimal and hexadecimal values all next to each other. So zeros are all zeros, ones are all ones, but now two, Binary ran out of places, so it increments to a 10, what looks like a 10 to, to you and me. Decimal and hexadecimal are both fine. We continue on. Binary keeps running out of places faster than everything else, so it has to increment faster. 
it gets to the value, the, what looks like 100 at the number four, continues up and up and up, right? Uh, decimal, we, it takes until 10 to run out of digits, and then hexadecimal it takes until 16 to run out. So what's the point? Why, why do these different bases? Um, so there's different reasons for it, uh, for, for the way that we've naturally, you know, come across these. So binary is great. Like I said before about electrical signals being on or off, right? One or zero. That makes it very easy to physically represent numbers in a computer, which is entirely electronic, right? Uh, decimals, there's a lot of debate on this one, but, um, Maybe just because we have 10 fingers, 10 toes, right? 10, 10 being a nice countable thing that we kind of grew up with, right? Evolutionarily. Um, so that's possible, but it's, it's not clear. It's also, it's a fairly clean way to represent numbers. Uh, but then hexadecimal, why the heck do we use that in CSS? Well, it allows us to represent a number of th a number of, of values in a in a tighter space, right? So if if our values on a typical visual screen array are values between zero and two fifty five, that only takes two hexadecimal places to represent. So in the and all this to say, the idea of why you might use different bases has to do with the information density, right? So hexadecimal is quite dense, right? The number 220 in decimal is, in, it's just DC in hexadecimal. That's, we've saved an entire slot of information. Whereas binary, it takes you, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight whole digits to represent it. I should have known that. You should have known that because it's less than 256, right? So, but the, that's the idea. This is why different number bases exist. Um, and, and this is how we see that you know character values in strings are represented in in binary because hey the physics work but now let's talk about a different base rewind to the dawn of history how did humans first count anything the answer if you think about maybe stones right there's one stone there's two stones there's three stones there's four stones this is a unary counting system. And what we just learned about bases, unary should make some sense now. So <clears throat> un being one, unary, the maximum number of values per digit is one. So that gives us a problem. It's, it's tough to represent um, a, a filled space and a not filled space. So typically when you use unary, you have to have some value there for a delimiter. So zero in this case marks the beginning of a number. And then if you hit another zero, that means it's the end of it. So one is just zero one, two is zero one one, five is zero one 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 one. What the heck are we doing? Why, why are we doing this? It's so, that's so few values, <clears throat> right? So what is, what are we gaining by trying to learn unary? You know, unary seems to be the least inform or the least information dense, right? It, you you get the least information out of each bit, each um, I guess it unit of unary. And you see here, at, you know, as as the others have scaled up to sixteen, unary takes takes its sweet time and spends a lot of information on it. So what's the deal? What can we do here? So. For compression, remember that we're trying to reduce things in a way that gives us, that frees up the most space, right? And if you look at unary, it starts out very small and it starts to grow really quickly, but it starts out very small. Um, and binary codes, right, the... the uh, the, the bytes that we represent numbers with and, and letters and all these characters, they're always going to be the same size. So just that how they, how they work in your computer hardware. And this, that, that also helps to make sure, oh, this is the same amount of information for each one. So the idea is you can combine these two base systems into a sort of algorithm to create a new encoding. And that is the Huffman encoding. 
This is the, the compression algorithm we're going to take a look at. So what Huffman does is it, it finds this way of combining the unary idea of like starting out very small and representing um, certain things in very, very few values, and then also binary to sort of shore that up so that we don't just keep adding unary values that are going to grow unbounded. So here's the general idea you're going to find the most frequent characters in your text and you're going to give them priority for the low, low, low unary values. And then you can also signal, uh, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start using a little bit of binary by a certain number of padded zeros to help indicate that doesn't make any sense up front. Let's, let's dig in. So what's the most frequent letter? You'll make that a one. Just one one. Anytime you see a one that doesn't have some other signaling zero ahead of it, it's just that letter. Right off the bat, I hope that's kind of showing the best case here. If you have a string that's entirely E's, and each one of those E's is taking up eight bits of information, but all you really need to do is say, well, all of the letters are E, we can represent all of the E's as a one. We'll, we'll see more of this. So the most frequent letter takes up the least space. You can see on the table on the right, uh, letter A, say it's the most frequent thing in your, in your text. Uh, the probability of each letter being an A is 15%. So the Huffman code is going to be one. Then the second most frequent, we pad it with a zero. Now it's going to take up double the space, but it's less frequent, right? and you keep going down the third, fourth, and fifth. Now we're not going to just going to keep extending the unary pattern. Now, if you have two zeros, that means the next two characters are going to be sort of a binary switch. So you can have the one and the zero, the one and the one, or the zero and the one to help, uh, to help figure that out. So when you have, so it, the, we use the padding in the characters, in the letters, in, sorry, in the string, in the bit string, you use that padding to signal how much, how dense the next bit of information is going to be. We're going to walk through an example. Don't worry. So just to, to take a note though, of, of natural letter uh, usage, this is a chart of the, uh, the usage of letters in, na in most natural language, not all natural language, but in, you know, some body of text, you get a lot of lowercase letters of a variety of, of different values. I'm gonna guarantee that top in English, at least, that highest peak in the lowercase letters there on the right, that's gonna be an E, almost certainly. Um, uppercase letters, you see much less of. The space you see a boatload of, right? Spaces probably are a good candidate for being the most compressed value in your text. So, let's have a look at one of these tables. So here's an example. Well, we will walk through a separate one, but here is, here is one example to just run through really quick. That's the same encoding table that we saw before, right? So the letter A is the most frequent and it has a code of one. B is second most frequent, zero, one. C is zero, zero, one, zero. D is zero, zero, one, one. E is zero, 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 one. And again, those are still much smaller than the, uh, than the, the byte right? We do approach, you know, we, we get to a point where we're not saving much space, but by then we're in the more infrequent letters, right? So we're, we're making a bet that the most frequent letters are going to take up most of the space and we can condense them further than everything else. So in this case, C becomes 0010, E becomes 0001, G is a little longer, a little less frequent, so it has lots more, but there's an A, you know, going left to right, just, just tra tracking this. D, F, B, E, A, you encode each one, you smush them into bytes, and now what used to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bytes for this nine letter string is now four bytes. That's pretty good. Let's do our own example, a full walkthrough. So <clears throat> you have here, Abacab, those are those are letters, right? Uh, if you know Lisp, you'll see these. There's a lot. Abacab, cut it editor, that kind of stuff. So here, this is our our text that we want to compress, right? So what's the most frequent letter? 
we can start building our compression table right away. You might have thought A, but remember, spaces are characters too. So we have five spaces, that's going to be encoded as a one. We have three A's, that'll be a zero one. We have two B's, that'll be a zero zero one zero. One C, zero zero one one, and that's it. So if we look at the original encoding, how you would have to store this information in an 8-bit Unicode um, encoding, we have A, that's going to be one byte, space is a byte, B is a byte, space is a byte, and so on, until we run out of letters, right? That's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 bytes, so 88 bits, 11 bytes. When we encode, when we run this through the Huffman encoding, well, we're going to transfer each one of these down. We're going to see how each one of them packs downward. So an A ends up being 0, 1. A space ends up being 1. B is 0, 0, 1, 0. Space again is 1. A is 0, 1. Space again is 1. C space, A, space, B. And that brings us, when we, when we smush them all together, this fits just inside three bytes, right? We are, you, so you are able to unambiguously run through this smushed together pile of, of information and find, we can retrieve, because we know the compression table, what was used to compress, you can retrieve all the values out. That's exactly how zipping works. It compresses in this same kind of way. There are more advanced techniques. This is a very the, the most straightforward one. Point being that what used to take 88 bits to store, we've now crushed into 23 bits, which is 2 and 7 eighths bytes. This all works even better when you have larger Unicode. So 8-bit Unicode is, you know, it's full of all these crazy infrequent uh, emojis and, and the small, you know, the small characters that we've all grown accustomed to. There's a lot more than 256. So again, compression works wonders when there's more information possible. So ultimately, what this compression, this Huffman encoding that we've run through here, it's achieved this 3.82 to 1 compression ratio. That's pretty great. Right, we have we have collapsed what was almost four times as much information into four times less information, whatever less means in ratios, you know. So that's there we go. That's how the Huffman encoding works. So that's the idea of text compression. Uh, depending on the distribution of your text, you can really get good compression ratios. Now. If everything was completely uniform, that's not this wouldn't work at all. If we had always had the same number of A's, E's, and G's and Q's, then there would be no point in trying to do this. But that's not how our language works. Uh, as a, as a rule of thumb, four to one is pretty dang good, um, original size compared to compressed size. Uh, but the more skewed your distribution is, the more likely you are to get a lot of mileage out of this kind of compression, especially if you're, say, compressing HTML, right, where you are running into the same characters just all the time, and they're, you're using the same kinds of, you know, the, the open brackets, the, the non-breaking spaces, all these things that are, are trappings of, of programming, you will achieve some pretty good compression ratios with that, because they're going to be very frequent. But again, if it's more uniform, compression doesn't really do much. You know, if you have the same number of values for everything, uh, it's not going to be the same. So other considerations, um, Huffman encoding is great. Uh, it's not always going to save all the space possible. It will always get you some savings, but not always great ones. Uh, but a thought about this is that it is called, it is lossless compression, right? So lossless versus lossy compression. Uh, this doesn't really show up that much in text, but we'll look at some examples. Lossless and lossy. So compression that is perfect is lossless. 
or as compression that is a little more loose, but a little bit higher compression ratios um, is lossy. Lossless compression is any method that's gonna preserve the or original information perfectly. This is super important when you need all that information back, right? Uh, so if you compress your documents or your terms or your postings or whatever you're working with in an information retrieval system, you need to get them back intact before handing them off to the user, right? You can't say, here's most of Moby Dick, but all the K's and B's fall out, sorry. Right, that's that's not useful in these in this scenario. So lossless compression is is typically how we we handle text. But I think it's worth talking about while we're talking about compression. Lossy compression is kind of interesting. So in lossy compression, you are allowed to let some things slip by. Right, um, this is great for if you really want good performance. Right, smaller files, faster compression, and things like transferring over the internet. Right? You want to have smaller files so that you spend less time shoving things across the world at the speed of light. Right? Even though it's the speed of light, it's still limited. So you, you, know, you want to be able to compress more, um, more information. And, but but why, how can we accept lossiness? Well, a lot of times the user will never even really see the lossiness or perhaps they will never even notice it right? JPEG, photos, MP3s, these are all common formats that you encounter files in that are lossy. So, for example, in audio compression, audio and video are, are typically stored with something called a codec. A codec just means compression decompression algorithm. Codec. That's it. Today you learned. Uh, some codecs are lossless, so if you've ever messed around with audio, like high-end audio stuff, FLAC and ELAC, uh, the free and Apple lossless audio codecs, um, but most people don't, right? Most of what we stream is in an MP3 format. Sometimes a little less compression, sometimes a little more, but the idea is an MP3 says, look, your human ears are not going to be able to tell the difference if some of the bits of the music are smoothed over. You legitimately can't, most of us, unless you're a connoisseur and unless you have like special equipment to help you out, right? What this does, as, as I keep mentioning about compression, this makes it so that they are essentially streamable, right? It would be a lot harder to, to stream a, a, a Apple lossless audio codec to you through Spotify because Spotify is just a streaming service. It's just trying to pump bits at you at the at the, uh, the speed of light, right? So as you stream audio, it needs to be compressed, otherwise it's nev you're never gonna be able to keep up with the track. Not never, all right? Everything gets a little bit faster every day. We got 5G coming out. But um, yeah, so that's the idea of, of audio compression. This is the kind of thing that is a lossy compression. Maybe it'll be, be a little more clear if we look at image compression. So. Colored regions in images can get kind of lumped together and stored as a single blob. You, this should look kind of familiar to you. You see different resolutions of, information, of images all the time. The ones that are highly compressed look lower res, but really all that's happened is the algorithm went in and said, hey, look, we're not gonna keep all this information. I'm gonna lump all of these grays into the most frequent bit and again, kind of like the Huffman encoding, you can store the most frequent color in a single bit and you let the second most frequent color take up two bits and so on. So a highly compressed JPEG, it has lost, if you look at compare the, the on the right, a 4% um, information uh, sanity ratio versus 100% highest fidelity. On the left, you see every detail of this woman's face and hat and the feathery thing going on there. Um, on the right, you get only kind of the barest impression of most of that. You can probably tell she's wearing a hat. It's a little bit blurry. If you hadn't seen the other images, you, it might be a little bit of a task. But that's the idea. So you, you, this is this is exactly the same kind of process. It's saying, look, I know you would prefer to see the perfect image, but 
you're only you're we're gonna send you a smaller version, one that has been compressed more fully and treated more and more and more of the pixels as the same. You can see the blotched regions where the pixels are treated the same. So uh, video compression is is kind of it uses stuff from both ends. Uh, it uses both kind of the the regional stuff from audio compression and the um, or sorry, the regional stuff from image compression and the the different codecs and, and lossiness of uh, of moment to moment changes of audio compression. And it, the idea is the same. There's similar issues. Humans really can't tell the difference between the fully perfect raw information and the compressed version. Now, of course, whenever I say these kind of, I'm a, I'm a cognitive scientist. So when, when I say that humans can't tell the difference, of course you can tell the difference if you really focus and you force yourself to tell the difference, right? But really the question is, are you going to notice if it's slightly worse quality, but it's compressed four times, right? There's a balance between how compressed it is and how, qual how much the quality is impacted. And also this to, to show, this might help illustrate uh, the power of these codecs um, and, and like if there's a slight error in, in the decompression. So here's a normal GIF, right? Here's a cat and its owner has put a flower on its head. It is not happy. Now, let's look at a version of this GIF where the decompression has failed. Something in the decompression step has broken down. And you can see that a lot of the information in the stream and in, in the, you know, it's a temporal, it's a, it's a time stream as well as a space stream. We have, we have this, the spatial layout of all the pixels on the screen, but also the temporal layout of how they change each time. That's part of how the codec works. And if some piece of that breaks down, we're going to see that something goes horribly awry. <laughs> Don't worry, the cat's fine. It just looks wild. So that's the reason you might see that kind of error in, in the real world. And when you're out in the, in the internets, you'll, you might recognize now that, okay, that's because something in the stream of the compressed version of this file got snipped, got dropped, got left out. And now all of the transitions after it are kind of screwball. One more time, oh, poor kidder. So. Do we ever see lossy compression in text? Kind of. Um, when you think about stemming and lemmatization, that's a kind of a form of compression, right? We are, we are taking more possible values and condensing them to the same root. The root is also smaller itself. So there's more values getting stored in the same place and there's, there's less letters in those stems. So, I wouldn't normally talk about that as a as a form of compression because it has less to do with you know saving bits and bytes over over a large stream. But that's a way you can think about okay if if there was lossy compression in text that was meaningful stemming and lemmatization do that. Uh, we can also think of vectorization. Uh, that's actually completely lossy, right? Uh, we when we convert our documents or our queries into those TF IDF vectors you cannot get the original text back out. There's no way it's destroyed. Uh, but, and so we, you might call that catastrophic compression. It has been compressed into this structure that sure, it represents the document in a unique way, but you can't get that document back out of that compressed vector, but it's still quite useful, right? So, We've talked about now why compression is interesting and, and why it's powerful and what you can kind of do, how, how it's achieved in many ways. Um, and now we can talk about how to apply it. So in information retrieval, you're building your IR system. You might want to compress both your dictionary and the postings. Remember, these are great ways to, uh, the, one of some of the great features of having an index that you can separate is you could either do the dictionary or the postings depending on what's going on with your, with your needs, right? You can compress these things. But do you need to? And can, can we really rely on it to work well? These are two genuine questions about, okay, why should I consider different compression algorithms for, for uh, inserting into my information retrieval system? 
So why would we compress an index? Well, here's a law. Uh, I like these little statistical laws. These are interesting. Of natural language. It's called Heap's Law of Vocabulary Size. There's the formula. You don't need to memorize that. Don't worry about it. The takeaway of Heap's Law is that more documents will always result in more terms. So your dictionary will grow forever. You will never max out. Uh, as you add more documents, more terms will come into your dictionary, right? You can imagine a world where that's not true, right? You, you, oh, well, we've got the full English language, but there's always new combinations. There's, and that's what Heap's Law shows. When you, when you run this on many, 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 many sets of, of uh, data sets and, and um, document collections, Heap's Law tends to hold. You, there are, your dictionary will never stop growing. So the point is, an extremely large, large collection is going to have an extremely large dictionary. So do we need to compress if we're going to scale up? The answer is certainly yes, because your dictionary will never stop growing. Okay. The second question is, well, is this going to work? Like, is, is there, I, you know, dictionaries are strange. Postings are kind of strange. What, what do we gain from compression? Here's a couple of other, you know, statistical laws that are interesting. Rule of 30 is more of a rule of thumb, a kind of a heuristic in the field. Uh, the 30 most common terms in your search system are going to account for 30% of all of the tokens in your documents. Meaning things like the, a, and, at, all these little ones are going to be in so many documents, right? Another one is, this is a more of a law of natural language, so Zipp's law. And that is the second most frequent term is probably going to occur about half as often as the first. Third will be a th third place will be a third. Fourth place will be a fourth. You can see in in this little um, little uh, chart down here, the is the most common word in this collection, right? It's got fourteen thousand plus uh, uh, instances of the. Of is second place ish, right? And is right next to it. Uh, and, and so on down the line. So the point is that it is extremely skewed. Your natural language just is skewed. So heck yeah, this compression is going to help. So not only do you need to, is, is your dictionary always going to get bigger, but compression will always work on it. So if you're going to compress, if you're, if you're considering scaling up, you're going to want to lear learn how to implement a compression. Now, you, you wouldn't have to learn this yourself. Again, always, if you're trying to build these things from scratch, you would be able to find a way to implement this that's not you directly encoding Huffman encoding, right? Uh, but the idea is that when systems grow large, their dictionaries will too. And because it's natural language, you got to compress because it's going to be worth your effort. So... That's compression. It's a powerful space-saving tool. It helps you get around the constraint of representing information in all these electrical signals, right? Uh, we, we have to represent them in a particular way to get things out of them, but we are able to kind of put in some tricks to help us store that in a little less uh, filled out way. Uh, there's both lossless and lossy types of compression that you might use for different purposes. Uh, compression works best when there is a skew in your frequency. And I say term frequency here, but also if you have a video, for example, that doesn't change very much, it will compress very well. Like if you have a static background, even just by, by accident, you have a static background, there's fewer, there's so much more of the information in the video that is static, that doesn't change. It's more frequent, more frequent. So it's able to compress it. Whereas if you have a video that's changing all the time, shaking all around, it's harder to compress it. So this is great. It allows for lots of advanced techniques. Um, just in general, uh, just be aware of how it works, right? Understanding compression will help you out in life. Final thought. JPEGs are almost always compressed, though sometimes less heavily than others. Do a Google image search for anything and specify JPEG as the format. 
Look at one of the images. Can you spot any evidence of lumping colors together for compression? Check another image. More or less than the first. All right. Thanks. Take care.